All right. Three, two, one, and we're recording today. I am with Adam Draper. How are you, Adam? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, Sonny. Yeah, I am. I'm not going to lie. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. I was kind of looking, I was a little jittery this morning, doing my meditation, doing my jumping jacks, trying to get those out of me because I was like, oh, I can't believe I'm interviewing Adam. So I'm, I'm super pumped about today. I, I was excited too. I was like, uh, I was trying to think of like what what w- wisdom I could share about Bitcoin in general, and I we'll find out as well. We'll find I'll, out. I'll say. Cool. So, so, so as a as a as a level set as a level set, I usually try and I just like let people know where we kind of met or the first time we ever met, and I, I think I remember it pretty clearly. I don't know if you do. I don't know the exact year, but it was uh, I had applied on Boost.vc's website, um, yep. and I think you guys had said, okay, sure, come on in and. And I literally, uh, I had a chance to, to, you know, pitch you in your, in your office there, uh, in person. And so that was, uh, I think that I was know, our first I, time, right? Downstairs. It was, it was in our offices. It was, uh, I'm, tr- I'm trying to, I, I, what I'm looking through right now, I just wanted to look is actually the date when we would have connected and wow, it, we've communicated a lot over the years, Sonny. Um, okay. So we're at, uh, it looks like 2014. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's uh, 2014. Steel. 15, 2015. 2015. It looks okay. like it, it, you were referenced a couple times. No, it's 20. Well, 2014, 2015. It's like end of 2014, early 2015. Nice. Okay. And the, uh, wow. So uh, we, we've known each other a while. Ooh, mind blasting, as they would say in India. So um, another thing I want to do a level set on was one of my goals, because people are like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you wasting your time with these YouTube videos? This, that is is one of my themes um, that I feel is kind of untouched is not number go up. I'm not so intrigued by that. I think that's fascinating. I think there's enough people talking about it, but it's the stories behind the people that have helped, that I believe that have helped Bitcoin to get to where it is. Um, And one of my goals is to encourage more people to build on Bitcoin. That's kind of the theme, right? Building on Bitcoin and that you shouldn't be scared that it's not just about, oh, I buy some Bitcoin and I get rich. It's like, you can literally, you know, devote your life. You can find a problem and try and solve it. So that's, so, and you you being kind of at the, you know, to the, the nexus of so many Bitcoin companies. So I'm super excited. Okay. On that front. Um, okay. Okay. So what is your story? And, and, and okay. On that, on the point about your story, um, I mean, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not for you, but uh, for most of my guests, I treat the learning of Bitcoin as a bit of a singularity event, like as in, it has a big impact on many people's lives, right? And so, so really interested in knowing kind of, you know, your, your story before you learned about Bitcoin and then maybe like after you learned about it, you know, kind of how that affected the trajectory of your, your outlook of, of the world. Yeah, no, I, th- uh, I, have, I have a fascinating uh, gateway into Bitcoin and crypto. So I am, I'm excited to tell the story, but uh, before... So my before story uh, was, well, I, I, I grew up in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a different place, place now. It always had tech, but it, tech was sort of uh, one of the things. Now it's the only thing, right? Like it's basically the only thing in this area. Um, and it became notorious over my life uh, for building these amazing technology companies and the internet and Apple and Google and like within 50 square miles of where I'm sitting, you know, a lot of the most impactful companies have been built. Um, remember your first computer? <laughs> I do. I do remember. Which one was it? 386? Yeah, my, so my, my, my dad, my dad is a venture capitalist. Uh, and I should probably mention that if people haven't, don't, don't uh, know my heritage. Um, and my grandfather was a, is is a venture capitalist, uh, and he was and his his dad was a venture capitalist. So like you know, fourth generation venture capitalist. Um, I, I I guess I at some point it was inevitable, but I, I did not know I was going to be a venture capitalist. To be fair and frank, um, my so my dad uh, when when I was about five six, he brought home a Mac two, uh, and it he, it actually broke at some point. Uh, So I had a Mac two that I actually did play with, but he also took apart a computer with my sister and I, my brother was a little young, so you might not remember. And 
inside showed us all the chips and all that, like how it worked. And that's cool. still to this day, something my sister and I like remember. Huh. And uh, the other things that, I, I mean, I remember, my first, so it was a Mac 2. It was on my desktop. There was a game called, uh, what was what was the game I loved? And the reason that it's fascinating is I eventually met the guy who actually created this game. It was Spectre. It's called Spectre. It was this uh, vector-based tank game where it was a, it was sort of like you were a three-dimensional tank and, uh, but it was only lines. So it wouldn't have been able to load full color. So it was only <laughs> lines and you had to tank, take out all the other tanks. Huh. And I, I, what was fun was I, at Boost VC years later, obviously I wasn't six when I started Boost VC, uh, years later, I invited this guy named Sam Scalace to come speak. He was the uh, CTO or VP of engineering at box.com. Um, hmm. And he uh, was telling his story and his story included creating Spectre, this game, this like tank game, it might have been Vector, Spectre, yeah, I think it was called Spectre. And the, uh, and what was so fun was like, it was such a big part of my like, my, my like early days of the computer. Um, yeah, I remember my first computer. I remember falling in love with computers was because of Napster though. Which... Ah, I remember Napster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, well, maybe a lot of people don't even know. I don't know. A lot, of, a lot of the youngins nowadays probably have no clue, but well, why did you love Napster so much? So, so uh, it was a perfect time where I started to like music. Like, at, like it was about that age where you start to actually like listen to music for fun and like you come up with your preferences on music and, you know, like it was the migration from CDs to digital. So like a lot of people, a lot of the youngsters who might be listening to this don't know that we used CDs and before that it was probably records. Uh, like they're still called, what, what are they? They're still albums. They're still called albums. Uh, when they release something, but like that word technically has no meaning because it's just, you can be releasing one song or multiple songs. Um, so Napster, I think is probably the most impactful uh, company to the world. Uh, however, and I think there's a lot of proof, one being Bitcoin, but however, uh, it did not succeed, which is fascinating. And so the reason is, uh, so I, I started loving Napster because you're able to download music. And it was the first time that I, you know, I had AIM where I was chatting with my friends and stuff. Um, but it was the first time that I was like, I'm getting real value. Like a real product is being digitally sent to me through the internet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people also remember internet used to not be really fast. It was like pretty slow. So you, you were able to download like one song in 20 minutes and you'd watch this little, no one even, the, the loading bars are like, it, the internet's so good, like loading bars don't even really exist anymore. Um, it's a spinny wheel until it loads. And so I, there was something about understanding, like I have a folder that's on my desktop, whatever I put there shares with the world. And I, uh, and I'm scouring a search engine that searches everyone else's files and folders for other music. Um, and then it was also my first uh, world of digesting code, not code, but well, yeah, it, it was a code, which is you had to, because the music industry was going after Napster, Napster was brought down by the music labels because they were like, it's, it's illegal, it's, you know. Um, <laughs> meanwhile i'm a seventh grader just like downloading music uh the the uh and uh they they were they were going down but the technology still worked and so all these uh, everyone would misspell the song names so you would misspell like tim uh lake timber austin and you'd get justin timberlake's like uh crime Your river album or whatever and the uh and so I, I like loved it. It was the first time that there was some third party that was delivering value to me through the internet because before it had only been like individual like friends communication. Um, but you know, years later, and I, I'll use sort of technology as the translation. So I, my story began in Silicon Valley. I went to high school on the East Coast. It was a boarding school called Andover. Uh, in between high school and college, I tried to play professional tennis in Australia. Um, none of those things said anything like technology. Actually, I did get suspended. Not, yeah, I got suspended for 
going over the download limit at the high school for like, I was the person in our dorm who actually understood how to like download things, uh, it, not illegally. And, uh, and, and so, and they had a, they, they tracked how many megabytes you were using because they had one, they were only allowed as a campus to spend X amount of dollars on the bandwidth. And like, that was, it was a dumb thing to get in trouble for, but like, it was a dumb rule. Um, and so I went to high school on the East coast. I, I play, played some tennis. I ended up at UCLA. Um, and, you know, I always migrated towards like people who do things, uh, and who had big ideas. And I ended up, one of my friends eventually approached me <clears throat> named Thomas Foley and he, uh, wanted to start a company, uh, and the company was going to be a private stock market, which is a very popular topic today with the rise of things like Carta X and uh, Gut and um, Forge, and there are a couple others. And um, and se second market is is still there on Nasdaq as sort of a pricing algorithm for getting going public. But <clears throat> the and, and so we were early. I had never started a company before. Uh, I we learned a lot. We had to get approved as a broker dealer. Uh, we had to to be able to transact securities we had to uh, what year was this, like this what was year 20, are we in now great question 2008 2009 so it was mm. so uh the market had crashed uh the bitcoin white paper had been written and uh, but i i hadn't read it in 2009 and um and i was uh, i was you know i was fresh out of i was actually still in college while I was co-founding this company that my friend was full-time on uh, outside. And then I graduated, went full-time uh, and we did get regulatory approval during one of the hardest times to be a FinTech company and get regulatory approval. Uh, our alternative trading system license and broker dealer ended up being acquired by a company called Venovate, which got acquired by a company called Keystone, which got acquired by a company called Coinbase. So, a really funny thing happened where <laughs> okay. our creation, our broker dealer creation actually ended up getting acquired by a company I ended up seed investing in early. And the, uh, and so starting a company, I, I think, you know, I always, uh, when I was growing up, I always, uh, admired people who started companies, but I'd never done it from the ground up. I'd always sort of, uh, you know, I, my first couple jobs were telemarketer for a comic book company, uh, the telemarketer for a, a antivirus software company. Uh, I worked for like uh, my, I was a tennis counselor. Like there, there were a lot of things I, I was, but I had never really started anything specifically unless it was some, unless I was running an event at a, at, for a fraternity event at, in college or something. And so I, uh, and one time I was going to start a company selling uh, skateboards where I, I would make skateboards with my friend, but we ended up spending so much time making them that we didn't want to sell them. And so, because you make the art, you make the wood, you make the, um, and so like, I, I really hadn't started anything. And I admire founders so much because I went through four and a half years of building uh, expert financial was the name of the company. And I, you know, we, we, I'm still friends to this day with the, the other founders, Annie, David Pearl, Thomas Foley. Um, and it's because you, you have the world saying that this is not going to work and it's hard, right? Like it's truly, it's difficult to hear that and be having people be dismissive of it and having people like that's harder than rejection. Rejection's fine. Dis dismissiveness is the the thing you're fighting against as a startup um because it, and it's like a really it's a difficult death by a thousand cuts type scenario um and i learned a lot like the main thing i always tell founders is focus like i think we lost focus a lot and also just timing timing is a thing like my our timing was too early like just now carta x is launching just now like this is 10 years later than when we we were launching, um, it, it, it was timing and focus, and those two things will get you really really far. But it gave me a huge empathy for startups, 
and I had started to just sort of mentor a couple of companies in my, my spare time. And I invested in a couple of companies in my like fourth year at expert. And, um, and I, I, some of those companies were, one was Coinbase. It was in 2012. Another one was called uh, Plan Grid, Benchling, and Amplitude. And, uh, and you know, I, I didn't, uh, I invested about 25 companies, 20 companies that year because I was just sort of wanting to understand and help and support some founders. I got to the point where I was sort of like, hey, this, you know, mentoring these startups, helping these startups, I have something I can give now, which is experience. Like I can actually fundamentally add value to their process. Um, and I was like, how do I do that in, in a more uh, like collective approach? Um, how do I, how could I scale this a little more? And why, why Combinator was a model that pe people, that like some of those companies that came out of. And I was like, you know, this is probably the best model in venture capital. The companies get to know each other. And then in addition, like if you, if you coach correctly, like you can make a really big impact on like a group all at once. And so we, so we, we, we borrowed some structure from what that Y Combinator system was. That became sort of a market that, and we're, and so Boost emerged. So Bo what Boost VC is, um, we're the accelerator. I haven't even said what Boost VC is this whole time, but Boost VC is the accelerator for sci-fi. Uh, we uh, we happen to migrate towards the founders solving very very difficult problems with really really difficult technology, and like we just migrated towards these communities of people that happen to be incredibly uh, dense with like inspiration and energy. And that's what you want to migrate towards and invest in. Like when we got, so my story with, which brings me up to my, my Bitcoin story. Yeah. 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 I wanted to hear um, about, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cause I was going to say the Coinbase thing. Um, I'm really interested in as well, uh, but you must've had some sort of uh, you know, epiphany or interaction with Bitcoin. Uh, curious what, how that happened. So, <laughs> so, sure a lot I, of people I, are. so I, you know, it's so funny. I, I haven't told this story in a long time, actually, uh, about how I got into Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm glad I'm telling it now that the price is at an all time high. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, so my, my first time hearing the word Bitcoin was from Brian Armstrong. Um, Sweet. And so we met at a coffee shop in Mountain View, uh, which is in Silicon Valley. It was called Red Rock. And I hope that they make it out of the pandemic because I owe them a fair amount of uh, value at some point because I've actually done very well investing in companies who I met at Red Rock. Um, and so Brian uh, Armstrong, what he did though, it wasn't really about his pitch, but by the way, like early Bitcoin companies like yourself and other in the ecosystem, like from, from the years of 2012, really, when the startup ecosystem in Bitcoin started to happen to 2015, when the enthusiasm was like really, really low, like full, that was a, those are the true believers, right? Like those were the entrepreneurs where there was really no reason that this should have worked and still the community like prevailed. And that's that, I mean, that's, what's amazing about people, right? Like the, they get together and they solve big problems and Bitcoin is a story of de like decentralized belief and storytelling and the community being together but also building their own separate territories and like it's a weird ideology really like philosophy so i i met brian i'm starting at this coffee shop and i reached out i i mean i saw his, oh, his one liner on a, on a piece of paper and his one liner said uh digital currency marketplace and i it's a coinbase digital uh, digital currency marketplace and i said i don't know what digital currency is I don't know how there could be a marketplace of digital <laughs> currency. Uh, and uh, it was like the most uh, antithesis of any other like one liner I'd seen because digital currencies weren't really a thing. Like it wasn't other than like buying a sword in World, World of Warcraft, like no one was creating, it was never talked about as a currency. Um, 
I should say I took a video games class in uh, college. Because, so UCLA, uh, the, on, on Second Life, which did have a digital currency, real world digital currency in it. And uh, UCLA realized that the video games had become a $50 billion industry and they didn't have any like curriculum towards it. And, and in entertainment, like it was super important. So they were like, okay, we'll give this class a try. And so I took it twice. It was great. Um, <laughs> okay. The, uh, that was, so that was my only experience with digital currency up to that point. And hmm. I, uh, and so I was like, okay. So I met the, this guy at a coffee shop. He was perfectly nice. Um, I had a hot chocolate just in case anyone was wondering what I was drinking. This is too much detail. And I, uh, and I, you know, with, with normal pitches, you start off like, okay, so what do you do? And he, he goes, okay, do you know what Bitcoin is? And I was like, I, I just assume that I don't know anything that you just said. And he, he then said, okay, at some point, the world is going to be on one financial infrastructure. And I thought, why isn't it? That was my thought. Like in that meeting, my thought was, why isn't it? And I said, why? Yeah, that completely makes sense. Why isn't it that way? Like, why are these countries tethered together through different currency systems and middlemen, right? Like, why is the US dollar have to transact with a, the yen through a vehicle rather than just transacting? And so I started thinking of like this idea of a meta currency. And he said, I believe that Bitcoin solves this problem. I believe that it brings everyone to one financial infrastructure. And to be fair to Brian, it's been nine years now, something like that. His vision has never changed. Uh, and the, I, I always tell founders uh, that the one-liner is so important to a startup. We don't spend enough time coaching people on one-liners. But his, his vision one-liner was one financial infrastructure for the world. And his, but the one-liner for five years on the product, which is a different one-liner, I think this is something that a lot of people have trouble with, different one-liner is easiest way to buy Bitcoin. And that was it for five years. It was easiest way to buy Bitcoin. And then, you know, it's evolved to like, you know, currency exchanges and like all these web browsers and wallets and stuff. But in general, it's still probably one of the easiest ways to buy Bitcoin in the United States anyway. Um, and, and so I, so he, so I, the thing that got me into Bitcoin though, you, you're asking about the actual Bitcoin epiphany. So that was the first time I was thinking like, but I didn't know what Bitcoin was still. All I knew was this smart person is, and he had just left Airbnb to start this company in a market size that was a hundred million dollars total. And the, and Airbnb was already a billion dollar company. So like, the, I was like, okay, like, why, why would you do that? It's a rocket ship. Like, why would you leave a rocket ship? Right. Mm. Um, and I have this, this saying I say, which is we should be looking for rational people doing irrational things. Um, and, and Brian was exactly that. He was this very rational, pragmatic person who was jumping into a market that made no sense to build a company that could tie the world together. Um, but I didn't just take him at his word. I did diligence. Um, I did also take him as word, but like I did diligence and the people he connected me to, it was, you know, random Bitcoin people. And if you meet random Bitcoin people in 2012, like they're like, we're all a little weird, and, <laughs> but, but we're all also like, they were all the most dynamic and excited people. And they were like, if this works, this changes everything. And they were all in, like every single person was all in on the technology. It wasn't even on like the company or whatever. It was about Bitcoin. It wasn't about Coinbase. It wasn't about, it was about this, this core. And I was like, well, you know, you just want to invest in really, really great communities. And so I was like, okay, uh, I, I haven't told the, the final decision though. I was still back and forth for a while. And I started researching more about Bitcoin, trying to understand how Bitcoin worked. And, you know, read the white paper, had no idea what it meant. Like, you know, I'm still sometimes I reread it and I'm like, <laughs> I'm not sure I get all this. Um, and the, uh, and, and, and so I'm sitting, so one day I'm sitting on the toilet and I've, I, I, you know, I, I took a month or something to like make this decision and I'm very, you know, back and forth, back and forth. 
and I'm reading uh, The Economist, and it was, a tw- it was an economist from a year and a half prior. So it was an economist from like 2011. I invested in August 2012, so 2011. And I'm reading this Economist magazine, and I'd read it a thousand times. You know, when you have this stack of books next to your, your toilet, and you're like reading whatever stuff. Of course, there. of course. And, and I read it, and, there's a, there, and then I read it, and there's an article, and it says, The Bitcoin Bubble. And it was a full article on the fall of, of Bitcoin so it, because it plummeted to uh, like 30 cents from $30 or something like that. And I was thinking, this is from 2011. The price of a Bitcoin is $10 now today. Like someone wants this to exist. This is a real thing. Mm. Like it's not, going, it's not going to zero. Like these, they thought it was going to zero. It's not going to zero. And so I ended up calling Brian right after, told him the story about being on the toilet and, uh, and, and I invested and I invested in Coinbase. Now, the, the thing about Coinbase is no one really thinks about it, but they didn't raise their seed round. They didn't successfully raise the whole seed round. They only raised half. There was 600 K they were trying to raise a million bucks. Um, and it was because Brian had to go out there, educate the market on what Bitcoin is educate the market and then say like, oh, but I'm building this other thing that's on top of it. Like with like the thing, like it was impossible. Same with Unicoin, by the way, like same with all the earliest Bitcoin companies. Like they had to educate the market. Like no one gives the first generation crypto people like enough credit, like educating the market on what Bitcoin is, is like, uh, it was the hardest thing ever. Getting people to question money. Like that's crazy. Like go it, it, okay, I went to my grandfather, you know, one of the greatest VCs uh, of the first VCs and maybe greatest. And I said, hey, I'm, uh, I'm actually going to go all in on Bitcoin. Eventually, so that decision, so that decision where I got in on Bitcoin led me to completely focus on it for uh, early tribes of Boost VC, where I was like, there's smart people here. They're going to be fantastic like entrepreneurs and we were the first like fund ever to just say like raise up our hand and say like hey we're welcoming you and i remember writing a post uh and i i just recently sent it out that was my first bitcoin post that was about uh, that i i uh i ever wrote and it was in early 2013 and i sent it and i remember sending it tether tethering my phone for the first time to my computer while I was driving in a train. And so I was like, I was like, oh, this is cool. And then by the time I, the train ended, I already had like huge number of likes on Reddit. Like people were so excited about uh, just someone saying like, hey, th- hey, I want anyone to say Bitcoin could be a thing, right? <laughs> um, and so we, we, you know, we started backing early B- Bitcoin companies. And from that, we, Una, we met you, we met uh, Sebastian Serrano at Bitpagos. We met uh, like Jean from Shake Pay, we met. Uh, like I, I, you know, I, I got to meet. I, I got to meet all the banks of the world. I've met like mm-hmm. every bank. Uh, I got, I got to meet like from this one decision I made. It defined my career for ten years, and um, the meetings I was in, the inf- like the 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 people I met, the network I built, like all of that, I have to Bitcoin to thank for. And it was really just. People reaching out and saying like, hey, I'd love to talk to you about the Bitcoin. And, you know, some people dismissed it like as a joke. And then some people held on and they they bought or they uh, like I, re- I remember someone saying that it was a cut in an early tribe where it was mostly Bitcoin people. They looked around. And they were like, these are all the smartest people I've ever met. And they're all working in Bitcoin. And so they put their whole like all of their money into Bitcoin. And now they're doing very well. Um, and, and, they, and they held like that's, everyone's like, oh, if only I bought Bitcoin at 10 cents, no one holds that like, no one is well, like, no one has that, that re- restraint. Like if you get a hundred X on your money on your like 10,000 bucks or whatever, like you're, you're not whole, you're not hodling. Like that's, that's r- ridiculous. And that's why, you know, Bitcoin's a philosophy. Like it's a, it's a, because these people who are really in, like you need to have something other than the fact that it's worth a lot of us dollars 
like tethering you to the technology. And it's really still to this day, uh, you know, Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss I had on my, uh, po my podcast and they said, you know, you used to fail out of Wall Street and jump into crypto. Like if you failed, uh, <laughs> like, uh, like 10 years ago, like it was the failed traders would, would jump into crypto. And it was, you know, there were a couple of those that were in early. And he said, now, if you fail out of crypto, you go to Wall Street. <laughs> and like that, and, and so like knowing that this talent pool had this huge flippening where it's like, there are so many smart people working in this space. There are so many dynamic people where the talent pools are going, they're going to crypto. Like they're going, I call it crypto, whether you want crypto to de be defined as blockchain or Bitcoin or whatever you define it as. I mean, that was a whole other thing where like I was all in on Bitcoin. So I didn't even see Ethereum coming. Um, like the, and, and like, I wanted everyone to stay focused, but I didn't realize that we needed, like the Bitcoin community needed Ethereum, like that we needed something that made us stick that, like for people to stick their heels in and say, no, ours is better. No, yours is better. Even though, you know, we're all fighting the same fight, right? Like we're all trying to decentralize money, give people control of their assets, you know, like, and some things scale better than others. Some things are a better store of value. I, I think that the community's just getting started and you know yeah now from then till now i remember the the uh pitch deck uh brian armstrong had ten thousand total dollars in volume in the two months that he had uh he had uh had as an exchange so as a as a broker of it wasn't even a broker i forget what he marketplace as a marketplace of digital currency that was his first pitch check. It was $10,000 of volume was his growth chart. Zero to $10,000 of volume. That means he made, I don't know, 500 bucks or something. And I, uh, I was like, I, and like that, I didn't even, I ignored that basically because, you know, it's, it's not like a crazy amount. And now if you look at, it's, he's, I mean, Coinbase is doing $3 billion a day. So the, the other thing that I would say I, I didn't see so here, you asked about the epiphany and I've gone off track a little bit, but the epiphany, that epiphany has led to every network connection that I have. It's all people. It's all great people. It's all, and I am so thankful that I just happened to be a curious enough person that I was able to start asking questions and thinking that when people said, no, that will never happen in my head, I, I would go, I think it can like anytime in my whole life, anyone has ever said, you can't do that. Like my brain goes, okay, I'll just spend all night and figure out how to do it. And so that's what the Bitcoin community represents, but on a scale of millions of people, right? Like it's millions of people sticking their feet in the sand saying, Hey, what if there was a better way to create monetary policy? Like, what if there was, it's not even, this is the thing. It's not even like, we're all okay. Like we, we, maybe Bitcoin's not the right way, but let's give it a shot. Right. Like, and like, give it a real shot. And so I, uh, I think that I was just fortunate. Like, uh, my, my grandfather says, uh, luck in, in life, luck has a way of presenting itself. And it's, the, it's the people who understand how to take it that end up pretty successful. And I think I was just lucky on the right day with the right people. Like, I, and, and I think my job is one where I just get to be, I get to surround myself with really lucky people and I get to be lucky by association. Um, I bet, I mean, th telling the story, it's like, looking back, I'm so thankful to all the great, great people. There, wait one sec. There, I have to, this thing. Okay, one second. I have to turn this thing off because. Oh, okay. We're good. We're back. We're back. Can you hear me? Hey, um, Adam, I was gonna say, ask you one thing, um, because you. Okay, so I think if I didn't miss, if I didn't miss hear you, I think, um, and I think I, I thought I heard this or read this somewhere elsewhere as well, is that your, I think either your grandfather or great grandfather, essentially invented the idea of venture capital. Is that erroneous? So, so invented, so it depends or not on me invented, because but like te technically like, I don't know, like uh, empires have been investing in innovation for mm. centuries, 
Um, but as individual private uh, like entities of companies investing in others, um, there were the Rockefellers on the East Coast. And then my, my, my grandfather with his grandfather founded a, a, a fund called Draper, Gaither and Anderson um, in, uh, I don't know, it was 1950 or something like that. Wow. And so it was like the, the, one of the first like three venture capital funds. And then my grandfather evolved to uh, partnering with his best friend, Pitch Johnson. And then they actually parted ways and he, after they founded uh, Sutter Hill Ventures, Sutter Hill Ventures still runs today. It's a, uh, so, I mean, Sutter, Sutter Hill did Snowflake and NVIDIA. And so like they're, they're sort of crushing right now. But the, he, he also was the first fund. My grandfather, I, I don't know how much I want to talk. Well, I, I love talking about my, my grandpa. I still meet with him every two weeks and have <laughs> breakfast. So I love talking. He's like one of my favorite topics. But he, uh, he after he ran Sutter Hill for about 15 years, I think, um, he left and worked in the, uh, for the government. And he was the uh, head of the Export Import Bank. And the, um, then after he came back and he worked for the Bush and Reagan administrations over an eight year career in, in government. And then when he came back, he uh, started the first ever venture fund in India. And That's, I was gonna ask you about that too, but yeah, okay, continue. Well, and it, my grandfather has a story. He's very good at becoming a monopoly. So he goes where no one is and then like fosters innovation in that mm -hmm. area. And he's so good with people. He's so charming. He, like he's, he's just a captivating guy who's able to sort of leverage his experience to be able to help, you know, at people who have commitment and energy to build huge, huge companies. And so, um, yeah, his, his India fund returned like 15 X the fund or something. So India so, is so, a big economy. Yeah. A huge. So I was going to say another question I had was the, where I was kind of going with this was that you know, as an entrepreneur, like I mean, when I when I met you, at least I don't think Ethereum was really that big of a deal. And by the way, having bit, like I'm 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 from Toronto, right? So uh, I literally saw Ethereum being coded in front of my eyes. Um, but I was just curious, like you know, there's a lot of, I guess you could say, um, dislike from the Bitcoin community towards the Ethereum. And one of the I think things that fueled that was the ICO um, boom. And what it I think in in essence enabled people to do is to just kind of not have to necessarily, you know, go to uh, a certain group of people and raise money and, and, but it kind of democratized it. But I'll be honest, from my perspective, I, it was a little bit weird too, because I didn't want to be able to take money from my next door neighbor and have that chance of, you know, just like opening the door. But can you speak to that dilemma a little bit or not dilemma, but kind of that, that, I don't know how, so, what was your brain kind of going through as you were? So what, one, of best, one of the best, yeah, one, yeah, yeah. one of the best Bitcoin, <laughs> One of the best Bitcoin conferences I ever went to was in uh, North Carolina. It was in, in North Carolina and it was called Cryptolina. And they, they actually flew me out. It was in 2014. It was like so early and they had 600 people show up. It was like a pretty big conference. And, um, and I, it was the only time I actually met Vitalik, whether or not he would remember. And I also saw him speak. And I was at, at this mindset, right? at that time where I was just like, let's stay focused on Bitcoin. Like the community is not big enough. The market's not big enough yet. Like we're still so small compared to everything. Um, and like, now you're throwing this other thing at me when really I, like I should have been like welcoming of a new idea, like re re uh, refusing, like the idea is the reason Bitcoin didn't like everyone was saying no to Bitcoin on the, it, so I should have been very accepting. It's actually led me to be much more accepting of the things that I have that uh, that immediate feeling of like, hey, my idea when my ideology and my incentives are not for this thing working, I try to keep myself in check now because, I mean, essentially, I missed Ethereum, right? Um, <clears throat> and and I I I also was I wasn't sold on it, but the one thing that it solved for that. Uh, every single company that we invested in at Boost VC, uh, like, by the way, we've invested in 110 
Bitcoin or crypto related startups now, like, I mean, uh, ether scan, unstoppable domains. Like we, we, like we have just a huge, huge, uh, protocol labs. Um, we were the early check into polychain and the, uh, and the one thing that it allowed these companies to do was fundraise where no Bitcoin company was being taken seriously in from institutionals. And so what Ethereum did was they created a smart contract that essentially allowed you to fundraise just from people who were in the market. And I agree. Like, I agree. Like, I might have not wanted to take money from just anyone, but the fact that these people were so frustrated, this is the story of crypto, right? They were so frustrated that no one was giving them money. They invented a new way to take money. And like, yes, there were scammers. Yes, that happened. Like, there was no way of vetting these projects. There was no, like, obviously that happens, but it was born of a frustration that was keeping everyone out of capital fundraising. And it was another war on just fighting institutional, like the structure to allow like innovation to take place. And I, like every time you try to keep the crypto community down, like they're just always going to win. So I'm just like, I, I, I basically, now it's just, Throw, throw, you throw any check into basically 10 projects, like one of them's going to do well. Like the, <laughs> the innovation in this market is basically you, they have been hit by regulation, like knows the, like the whole, like every single step of the way, these people have had to say, do I really believe, right? Do I really believe that this is the way? Do I really, and they, and they've, they've been the rhino, like paving the way through the forest, and so like this, you know, I think that the crypto community is the most formidable uh, ecosystem basically on the planet. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to interrupt. No, I was going to say, can you segue into cockroach? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah well, uh, obviously. The, so one of this was stemmed actually from these crypto companies uh, early on. And by the way, so many crypto companies have been like, thank you so much for the be the cockroach line. Dude, uh, like, I mean, like, oh, just wait till the Bollywood so, so we, movie, man. Uno coin will be like your poster child for cockroach. But it, please, we need please. The, <laughs> we, we need the, we, we need the you, Brian children. can be your IPO poster child. We'll be your cockroach it, poster cockroach. child. Cockroach. <laughs> but, but I, I want I, people to know about this because this is probably the one of the most, I don't know, transformative things that we walked away with after, you know, spending a month or whatever it was, two months at Boost. <laughs> we... We saw this thing happening. It was mostly with the crypto companies. It was others where they just, we knew that timing was the hardest thing to guess. Like we weren't going to be able to predict like the timing of the market. I'm making it sound like it was way more like cleverly thought out than it actually was, which was just like, I was like, I want uh, the, the first. Okay. So really one of our companies, the first company we ever backed, it's, it was named Favor. It was not Bitcoin. It was not crypto. It was called Favor. It was a food delivery startup. And the thing about Favor that blew my mind was they lived in every office they ever worked in until it was acquired. They still basically slept and lived in the office. Um, they, uh, they were up all hours of night. They were obsessive. They like, they had this, uh, always keep their eye on the ball of favor and never letting it fail type thing. But they also ran out of money four times. And, 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 th but, but it was one of these situations where every time they told me they were out of money, I was never worried that they were going down. Right. Like I was never worried that it was going to fail. And I was like, these guys are cockroaches. And actually they, they, they even, they said it in general conversation. They were like, yeah, we're just cockroaches. I get it. And I was like, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that line. And so I, I was like, I'm going to imprint this concept on every founder who comes in the door and you need to be the cockroach. You have to survive a nuclear Holocaust. You have to survive the, you have to survive. And because I believe that we were at Boost VC, we picked the, we picked the best people. Like, I believe that we pick amazing, amazing founders, people who uh, are genuinely authentically committed to their projects and they believe in themselves and they have the energy to make it work. Like, I believe that our structure for picking works. The, the, 
the thing that we can't necessarily, we have no control over is whether or not the market's ready for these new technologies yet. And so it's like, we need them to live. And uh, so we, we started to say this line, which was be the cockroach, like be the cockroach. And I wrote a post and I posted it. It's probably my most popular post of all time. Um, in the last year, so many Bitcoin companies that you included, but so many Bitcoin companies have been like, hey, I need to thank you for imprinting Be the Cockroach in our, in our company, because that was the thing that kept us going through the hard days. Like, and there's hard days, right? Like there's always hard days in, in a startup. Like, do, are we doing the right thing? Is this like what I was talking about, all those barriers for every crypto company that has to go through where it's like, do I actually care enough? Do I actually want this to happen? I mean, Unicoin story is formidable, like amazing, right? Like it's a, uh, it's the most cockroachy story of all time, and the, uh, and it I think gave people a, a feeling of community around the idea that there were, were going to be hard days, but if we just survive, we will succeed, and that ended up being I love it. I love saying be the cockroach. I, we still have it on like, it's, it's a little bit of a branding problem because we still have it on like 90% of our branding and most people don't know what that means. We're like, it just says like boost VC, be the cockroach. It says nothing about our accelerator or our fun. Like it, like half of the stuff is just be, be the cockroach. And it's like, I, like, I don't know. It's, it's provocative. Just, I don't know. But I think, I think most people know that cockroaches don't die. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But I, I just thought it was always like, you know, everyone's talking about like pretty unicorns and like this and that. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, what did Elon Musk say? Like chewing was, glass and staring into the abyss, right? That's literally one of my favorite quotes. And, <laughs> and you're right. You're right. I, I realized that I didn't want unicorns because eventually so, you, everyone wants to invest in a unicorn, right? But like, what are they before? Like, that's what we're trying to pick. We're trying to pick the people, the people who have the right potion that make this unicorn. <laughs> And they're not unicorns at the beginning. Mm. They're cockroaches. And mm. th that's, that's what the thing is. They are so diehard. They are so in the weeds. I'm glad that you brought this up because I haven't talked about the cockroach nearly enough uh, in the last year. Um, and, and you know, oh, sorry, Adam, uh, I was going to say is like, and I think the cockroach thing for me, like, you know, I think intelligence is one of those things that everybody's all about, like, you know, like smart people, blah, blah, blah. But I think the thing that people don't value enough is courageous people. And, and the thing that I've been really inspired by Sattvic, I mean, I'm more like a, a storyteller, like the face of, you know, Udokoid. I, I don't do most of the hard lifting with Sattvic and Harish and these guys do. But, um, but you know, but that the level of courage that I've seen from these guys and from others in the Bitcoin community is unparalleled, unparalleled. Um, okay, so- Courageous. So, okay. I like that. Courage. It's backing yeah, courageous. Man. Yes. So, you know- it, you know, everyone's saying, uh, you know, everyone's always like IQ because that was easier to measure. Like someone came mm. up with a way to measure IQ and it's like memorization and puzzle solving. That's how I think of like IQ. And like, that's fine. For startup founders, I think it's an intelligence test in the opposite direction if you're going to start a company. Like <laughs> I'm not, I'm not insult. Like I think everyone has some level of intelligence. Like I'm not saying that, but starting a company is like, there is no right answer. There's only the answer on the day. And so you hit your head against the freaking wall every single day for a year. And, and then it's, and I, I'm, I'm willing to go on record saying PhDs, it's like, they think too much. They don't make, they don't, they're not action oriented. And so like courage is a good way to describe like this, there's EQ, IQ, and then there's this like, are they willing to just do it? Like, what are they fearless and courageous <laughs> enough to just like, yeah. like break the thing? Exactly. Um, People I like are gonna it. hate this one, but uh, I think informally I refer to that as balls of steel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or at least it's on such mixed No, <laughs> it's just it's just the, it's the Nike just do it. Like just I think it. the just do it. It's just like hey, like it might not work, but you need to be okay with that. Like, and you need to just not not the company. The company will always work. Is basically like what your mindset needs to be. It will never fail. And then, but the, the trials to make it succeed, 50% of them fail, like more than that, probably 75% of the things, but you just have to keep trying because eventually you just build up enough trust that like people believe in you. They know that you're not going away. The, the be the cockroach thing. Like I, I, I mean, my wisdom preceded my uh, intelligence there. 
the uh, I don't I don't know if that's a saying, but it definitely did because I think now that I've been doing the same job for ten years, uh, the fact honestly, the fact that I'm just I've been here for ten years lets people trust me that I'm that I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I think there's almost a like f- fear of just like change, like changing your career, change. Like there's so many of those happening that if you just stay the course for long enough, people are just like, Hey, you're not going anywhere. Like you're, you've been here, you're going to continue to be here. And it just drives so much more like value. And like your brand becomes very solid to people because you've just been there for so long. Um, we made so many mistakes. Like I, I, we won't go into those, but the, because I don't even think about, honestly, people ask me about the biggest mistakes I make. It's like, you don't even notice them because you made so many that it's just, you keep going through the fire. And the, you know, uh, do you know, do you know yeah. Vinod Kosla? Uh, yeah, I've met Vinod and I've also seen him give a acceptance speech Sick. of an award. It was so cla- It was a great speech, but oh. See, my favorite quote in the world to this day still is success matters. Failure is inconsequential. Yes. Success matters. Failure is inconsequential. I live and die by that, which it, is like, try everything, you know, try yeah, everything. Yeah, so it's, it's <laughs> how fast can you iterate failure is basically the question. And SpaceX yeah. is a perfect example of that. Like everyone sees these huge rockets go up and explode and they're like, oh, you failed again. And Elon's like, we just learned a lot. And it's not even Elon, like it's the whole team, the teams. Like what Elon's amazing at is, a startup is just an organism to attract all the smartest people in the world to work on your mission. And like that, that's what founders need to be able to do. They have to actually be good tor- storytellers. They have to be, con- have heavy conviction. They have to attract great people. And because you can't do it all. No company is one person. Like that isn't a company. That's a, a person. And the, uh, and Elon is the best at coordinating large amounts of people to on a unified mission. And like, that's why Elon, right? And so I, I think that's the thing. Sometimes there's this early stage startup behavior. Um, and by the way, the, the fascinating thing about Bitcoin is we're all on the same mission on separate lines. And it's, I think it's the first like mass coordinate, coordinated effort on in this, this way. Like where it's, we're all coordinating with each other at the same time because we have this thing called the internet and we can coordinate now. Um, But we, and we're all attacking this one major problem that we're like obsessed with. And it's like millions of people taking different shots at it. Like, I think in some ways, Bitcoin has increased the the, uh, failure rate. So we, we, so that we can take more shots. And so it mitigates more risk of what will work because we see what's not working and the uh which is exciting totally totally hey adam um wow by the way if you ever um this is so fascinating and electric i was gonna ask you a question so okay the first question was kind of like around your story bitcoin i thought that was like marvelous like you know props to brian man i, I love him and by the way uno coin for the record i've said this before was inspired by coinbase too right it was a co- co- conversation between me and david johnson he was like dude like why is there no platform in india and here we were just doing meetups week after week and we're like yeah <laughs> like why i mean and, I, the, shake, shake pay was the same in canada and, yeah uh, yeah Re, repio was the same in south america i was like i basically so, was like okay coinbase is gonna own the us let's go everywhere else yeah so respect <laughs> where respect is due so it, it definitely um you know uh, so that was beautiful you know your story around boost i thought i mean if there's anything else you want to share on it please uh i think is marvelous and what you're doing for the community and and everything right um the Third thing, the kind of the, you know, one of the questions I like to ask is, is what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin may or, you know, would disagree with you on? Um, you know, we did touch on the Ethereum topic. That's an obvious one, um, you know, uh, and, you know, just working hard on that. But but any any anything that's like, you know, I guess it's like the Peter Thiel question, right? The contrarian belief. Uh, what is one so, thing? Yeah. So my contrarian belief um, is that, so crypto is this, uh, the w- Bitcoin itself anyway, is replacing third-party trust with mathematical proof. Like that's the one thing it does, right? Um, and we're seeing how impactful that is, where trust is so necessary and valuable. Um, 
but the the two things it gives us are it's a, it's the first solution to tragedy of the commons problems uh and i don't think it's been applied to those at all yet where tragedy of the commons is like because no one owns it no one takes care of it like and so i believe one of my my beliefs right now is actually that the bitcoin technology or the crypto technology is actually going to save the ocean because it will create a solution to this massive tragedy of the commons problem so i believe that Bitcoin will solve climate change because it, it, it is the way you incentivize tragedy of the commons issues, problems. Um, and it's the first time that's ever been possible to actually incentivize these, these networks to be valuable and the actual like collecting could be valuable and the ownership could be valuable. And so I believe that Bitcoin solves climate change. The other thing it gives us is scarcity on the internet um and so yeah but those are I, I said there were two things and i thought i'd say what the two things are so those were that was the second one but my i'd say my belief that other people maybe not in crypto necessarily but outside of crypto definitely accuse bitcoin of is that like we're creating more climate change i believe that the fundamental economic infrastructure that we have built is going to solve climate change it's the first thing that can have the impact. So that's my. I tend to agree. Hey, just quick question. Have you heard of Upstream Data? Have you heard of that company before? They're a company up in Alberta, Canada. I know most people haven't heard about them, but they are literally taking, uh, so you know when you take oil out of the ground, for example, by the way, I know this too, because I'm like, I'm from Alberta originally. Oh, I didn't know what it was. Is, is this the gas? They take that extraneous wow. gas that comes out as that they normally have to pay, you know, the government credits for or towards. They can now use that to mine Bitcoin. Again, I don't know the details, but it's yeah, just like there's this one there's of those this tax. Yeah. It's cool. It's a really interesting. Uh, there's this. Yeah, I don't know much about it, but when you say it about burn off, and now instead, yeah, yeah. what they do is they use it to turn into money, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. No, it's awesome. Yeah, cool. Okay, so Adam, that's been wonderful. Um, you know, there are, uh, I guess, two kind of things that are not super in the Bitcoin square, but I wanted to just bring up uh, AI, and maybe we can even touch on robotics. I know you had an infatuation with the uh, the Iron Man suit. Just quick. Uh, so I guess it's a kind of so, a big question, but thoughts around yeah. that? Yeah. No. So what I'll I'll say is like I've really focused on uh, crypto during this conversation, more out of uh, out of just I guess um, nostalgia more than anything else. <laughs> but what, what Boost VC is, we're the accelerator for sci-fi. We believe the most iconic companies are being built in sci-fi tech, where you can think of things like, like Coinbase, Unicoin, like Tesla, like SpaceX. It's these people who capture the imagination and are able to build uh, substance beneath it. And, um, and so Bo Boost VC, like, the things that people have thought were impossible happen to be very possible, which are, you know, I bet I've invested in an exoskeleton, Rome Robotics. I've invested in two jetpack companies, Jetpack Aviation and Gravity. Um, I've, in, I've invested in a lot of AI. I, I, I think that the things that, you know, Brian, Brian Armstrong was, he came and spoke. It wasn't your tribe. I think it was tribe two or three. And he, uh, session two or three at Boost, and he had just raised his, um, his Series A from Union Square. And um, he, he was giving sort of seven lessons that he felt were helpful in his, uh, like, getting to that point, which was early still, you know, Series A is still pretty early. And he said, you know, when I was fundraising, um, all the investors, they all said, the government will never let this happen. Uh, you need the banks. The banks aren't going to work with you. The uh, like economically, it's just not going to work. You need the government buy-in. Like all the reasons that it won't work. Uh, they're like th these are. This is too hard. And he goes, Yeah, I want to spend my life solving hard problems. If it was easy, other people would do it. Like that. That's how I feel about like sci-fi in general. I want the people who get rejected in that way and all of the rejections are obvious because it's too hard like if people said no because this is too hard 
I want to invest because I believe that in the short run, yeah, it's really difficult. But, but in the long run, that difficulty level becomes the moat that differentiates you from uh, like everyone else. And you end up winning because of that. As long as there's a market and you understand the customer. Um, it's, and so, it, yeah, I, I'm obsessed with the Iron Man suit. Heck, I uh, might as well just put it out there. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. is doing stuff in climate change and I would love to have him as a limited partner. So I'll, I'm, I'm going to try to chase that guy down. Um, hey, be, put it out there. Be, the I back Iron Man stuff and I'm passionate about climate change. Like VR. I, I don't know why. Dude, VR. Yeah. Just a quick plug <laughs> on the VR, please. Cause like, yeah, I, love, and, I love that stuff. <laughs> oh, dude. Okay. So uh, this is the first year and people just don't even notice. It's an ecosystem now. It actually has a market. It's big enough. Like the games are being sold. 60, 60 developers made more than a million bucks on the quest. Like that's a real, that's like early app store days. You, you remember when the uh, Apple app store started announcing like, dude, this one high school kid made a million dollars. Like, that that was uh, that's what's happening right now. Like the high school kids are making a million bucks right now in VR, and no, and the uh, and it is being professionalized. Quality is just better now. Like I went through the phases of bad VR, which was very sickening in like movement. Um, but for, the crazy thing about the future is like everything that we ever like as as from like the last twenty five years, thirty years, heard of as like being fictional in in movies or in whatever like all of it exists like it's crazy we get to live during a time when all this stuff is here and i get i get to invest in it all <laughs> <laughs> hey and so adam adam so as okay just to kind of like bring it all home right i know you got i, you, I want to be mindful of your calendar and stuff so um just to kind of call it the pink elephant, right? So there is obviously something going on, like I told you in India, where there's some movement around potentially banning Bitcoin. As an investor, as somebody from the lineage of families that, you know, pioneered VC and VC within India, India and America are aligned, they're, they're allies, right? Uh, they're both democratic countries. There's, there's this like collaboration between them. So, you know, um, yeah, do you want to maybe like if, if if there are, you know, like key stakeholders, decision makers in the country that are, you know, on the fence of, you know, do we regulate, do we ban? Do you have any, I don't, I don't know, any kind of messages for them about like what you think may happen if they do that versus if they, you know, choose to maybe embrace this, this very innovative and sometimes scary technology? Look, the, the countries that allowed the internet to run became the most powerful countries on the planet. They became the wealthiest countries because things like Google and Facebook were created in their country. Like those are things that we in the United States should take a lot of pride in. The fact that these, these companies, these that our citizens created impacted the world in such a drastic way. That next sequence, that next phase is Bitcoin and the blockchain and crypto. And if you aren't letting this, this, if you don't figure out how to, I'm fine with regulating, taxing, like all that stuff. Like, but if you're not going to let it happen, like you will be left in the dust. There, the most significant wealth transference is happening right now. And if you aren't a part of that innovation, you will be, you will not be one of the top countries. And I truly believe that to be true. Um, and I believe that most countries will be within reason allowing this thing to run free the same way that the internet did, and it'll make the world a better place for it. Um, my whole shtick is about just, we are humans. We know so little about the planet we're on. We know so little about the space we live in. We know so li little about our own brains. And for some, this technology will incentivize us to explore more, to research more, to do more and learn more about ourselves and our around surroundings. Um, and that's, that's what I'm excited about. So cool. yeah, if there are people listening, like the, the, the main thing is it's going to happen. So it's sort of, in my mind, it's like, get on the ship because otherwise you have a chance to enable it and be the leader rather than being, than being, you know, number 10. 
number 20. Like you're going to be so much farther. I mean, I know in startups, I mean, it's, you want to be number one. You want to be, you want to be first, first to market, always first to market. It gives you an edge. It gives you a moat. It lets you, as we were talking about earlier, like you've, you've already failed the first 30 times before someone else started. Like that's what it is. Yeah, man. Uh, well, I really appreciate your time, Adam. Where do people plug into your consciousness on Twitter, you know, boost where the domain kind of so, all that stuff if people want to. Yeah. So reach uh, out? if you want to uh, apply to boost VC, uh, we run two sessions a year with 10 to 12 companies and we invest $500,000 into sci-fi tech. Um, if you liked any of the, if you're the type of company that I've described over the last of this, please apply. Um, and follow me on Twitter at Adam Draper. I, I I'm very, uh, I, I'm very something on Twitter. I like, I, I, I think I'm, I'm very something on Twitter and I I'll keep your entertainment. How about that? I'm worth it. I'm worth the follow, but, uh, yeah. And I, Hey, just build stuff, do things. I, I, I'm such a, if you're a founder, I'm such an admirer just because you started something and you get to keep building. It's so fun. Like, oh, yeah, also have fun. I didn't say that enough, but have fun. Be the cockroach. Like, keep your eye on the ball. Yeah, that's actually one of my, our, my, my wife and I, too. One of our three tenets uh, is, is have fun. We always try and remind each other is like, that's kind of the point of all this. But uh, beautiful, Adam. Really, 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 really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, by the way, if you want to do this again next week, next month, next year, whenever, I'll just, I'm game. I'll just hijack this. I'll just hijack this. Dude, do straight up, one. the Adam Hour. Like, I'm, from, I'm from ready. Set, you, I don't set, even need to from, say anything. You, you've that, got, like, I just love it. Episode <laughs> 78 to 178 are all Adam Draper being interviewed. Sonny is now, uh, you know, in the back uh, <laughs> dealing with matters. Uh, Adam is now taking over. <laughs> No, this man, this has been great. You know, like I said, you know, I mean, you have obviously been pivotal in terms of believing in us, you know, way back in the day. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you do so much for the, the community. And uh, and yeah. OK, with that, we'll just, you know, bring it to a close. Just stick around for 10 seconds. Uh, there sure. we go.